Okay, I guess uh, we can begin. So hello and shalom. Welcome everyone to the Rubin Forum. Um, I'm Dr. Ori Sella, the chair of the Department of East Asian Studies, and I will chair this uh, meeting. Thank you all for coming to the meeting. Um, our guest today is Sergei Radchenko, Professor Sergei Radchenko, and I will ask uh, our very own PhD candidate, Sergei Bronstein, to introduce uh, Professor Radchenko to all of us. So, Sergei, the virtual floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are very uh, pleased to, to host a lecture by Professor uh, Sergei Rachenko as a part of the Forum Rubin. Sergei Rachenko is a Director of Research and Professor of International Relations at uh, Cardiff University. He has an international reputation for research on, uh, on the history of the Cold War. He has, he has written on uh, Sino-Soviet relations, on Soviet and Chinese foreign policies, on atomic diplomacy and, and, uh, and on the Cold War crisis. In addition, he has published work on Mongolian and uh, North uh, Korean history and continues uh, to have interest in the international politics of uh, Central uh, Asia and in uh, contemporary uh, Sino uh, Russian relations and uh, Russian foreign uh, policy. He has served as a global fellow and uh, a public policy fellow at the uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, Center in uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, as the uh, Didian Distinguished Professor uh, at uh, East China Normal University in uh, Shanghai. Uh, currently, his uh, research uh, interests center around uh, the global history of the Cold War. Uh, now, uh, I welcome our guest, Professor Sergei Rachenka, to deliver his uh, honorable speech uh, for the people who are present here. Thank you, Sergey. And uh, just a second before we uh, pass the virtual mic onwards, I would just like to mention that if any of you have questions, uh, please write them up in the chat so that I can approach you in the Q&A uh, section in, a, in an orderly fashion. Thank you very, very, very much. Uh, Professor Adchenko, the floor is yours. Thank you both. Thank you for this generous introduction and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you virtually. Um, I would, um, I just wanted to ask before I begin, how much time do we have? I think it's an hour for the whole thing or is it two hours? It's about one and a half hours in total. So okay. uh, if we have about, uh, um, let's say, 50 minutes of uh, talk or it's up to you and then the Q&A, that would be great. Excellent, excellent. Um, uh, the reason I ask that is I, I, I do tend to go over time. So feel free to throw something at me. I'm well protected. Uh, <laughs> which would, um, you know, uh, it would have uh, would have been very different had I showed up in person in Tel Aviv, which is one of my favorite cities. Absolutely, um, absolutely love it. And it's just uh, very unfortunate that uh, this uh, pandemic has prevented uh, uh, me from visiting there, although I congratulate, of course, uh, I think you're doing much better than the rest of the world, really, although we are catching up in the UK, things are starting to open, open up a little bit. Um, right, so the, the lecture that I will deliver today is a broad overview of Sino-Soviet, and perhaps I'll talk a little bit about Sino-Russian relations. Uh, as Sergei had mentioned, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a specialty of mine, going back some years. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a subject I have spent uh, some time on and have written uh, some, you know, have written a book on, on an aspect of the Sino-Soviet um, alliance. So I will talk about that. Right, where to begin? It's a very, it's a, it's a large subject. Let me begin by sharing a map with you, which I think will make things a little bit more understandable. So, here we are, can you see it? You can see Google Maps here. You can see the vast expanse of Russia. Always fascinates me how far north it goes. And it, you know, uh, I keep wondering what's out there. I don't think there's anything there. Uh, just, just as a little fun fact, I grew up or rather I was born on the Russian Chinese border. So Russian Chinese relationship has sort of followed me uh, from the 
from the time of my birth. And then I grew up on the island of Sakhalin. So I was born around here. I, I grew up around uh, the island of Sakhalin. So this is kind of, this is really part of my personal history as much as professional uh, interest. So the thing to know about, uh, about Russia and Siberia uh, and something that you immediately recognize if you ever decide to take a flight from Moscow in the European part of Russia over to let's say Vladivostok over here or Yuzhno Sakhalinsk, which is a flight that I've taken many times, you will, you will see if it's daytime, you look out of the window of the airplane and guess what you see? There's nothing. There's nothing there. There's what they call the Green Sea of the Taiga just forests, 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 some clouds here and there, uh, very little population. So the area which is so rich in natural resources is actually exceedingly underpopulated. The main Russian population, as you would know, of course, is in the European part of Russia and the Asian population of Russia is concentrated around a few cities which you cannot really see on this map maybe if I maybe if I do this oh that doesn't help what if I change it to this where are the cities and what happened to this oh now now you can see the cities okay so you can see the cities here Novosibirsk Krasnoyarsk the big Siberian city is Irkutsk uh, Ulan Ude this is the tr the the um, the transib right goes the railroad uh, well, they, I think the, the, the auto road follows that. And then you've got Khabarovsk somewhere up here in Vladivostok up down here. So you can see there are a number of cities that kind of follow the border. But if you go beyond those cities and the, the, um, uh, and the um, what is the, the railroad, if you go beyond, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. So in essence, Russian security in my, across this vast territory is has been very problematic historically, very problematic, and this is something that the Russians have been aware of, have been trying to deal with, and much of Russian foreign policy throughout the 20th century has been geared around this notion of protecting Russian security in Siberia and the Far East. Protecting from who? Well, protecting from the Japanese first and foremost, unless you go back to the 19th century and then you can talk about the great game between Russia and the Russian empire and the British empires. But by the 20th century, it's, not, it's less of a concern. What is a big concern, of course, is the rising power of Japan and uh, that could actually menace Russian security. So, so I keep interchanging those words, Soviet and Russian, but you understand my meaning. Soviet security in Siberia and the Far East of course, Russia, Tsarist Russia, had lost a war to Japan in 1904-1905, as a result of which Japan actually won um, southern half of Sakhalin Island. So the place where I grew up was actually Japanese until 1945. Maybe I'll have a chance to talk a little bit about that. Um, and, uh, and then the, the Japanese had intervened in the Russian Civil War. Then, of course, in the 1930s, there's growing power of Japan. The Japanese get involved in Manchuria here in the Chinese Northeast. And from that, Stalin sees an acute threat to Soviet territorial security. And so much of his foreign policy in the years before the Second World War in Asia is directed towards somehow redirecting the Japanese threat or maybe pushing back against the Japanese threat. Now, there are different ways he goes about this. First of all, he tries to deter Japan. And the key moment for that comes in July, August 1939, when there's a battle between the Japanese slash Manchukuo. Manchukuo was the Japanese puppet state in Manchuria between the Japanese and Manchukuo forces and the Soviet and Mongolian forces on the border between Mongolia and um, Manchukuo. Now, this is a, a very famous battle of Halkin Gol in Russian, as it's known as, as it's known in Russian, or Nomon Han. Sometimes it's known as it's known in the West, which the Japanese lose. Uh, this is one of those. Uh, this is the one of the early great performances for the later Russian uh, Soviet general uh, Georgi Zhukov. This is where he really shows himself as an excellent general. Uh, 
So this is this is an example, of course, of, um, of of Russia pushing back. And in fact, you can probably make an argument that the Battle of Halkin Gol actually changed the history of subsequent history of Second World War in Asia because it, it certainly deterred the Japanese in many ways. So the Japanese realized that perhaps the Russians would be a difficult price for them to invade. But there's also a lot of diplomacy involved here on Stalin's part. Oh, before I get to diplomacy, let me mention the other important way of um, of of assurance of. Soviet security in uh, Asia at that time is Stalin sponsors the so-called Second United Front between the Chinese Communists and Chiang Kai-shek. Now, uh, the Chinese Communists have been on the run from Chiang Kai-shek since really since the late 1920s, since of course the 1927 uh, anti-communist crackdown which wiped out much of the Communist Party in China. Uh, then Mao Zedong and Zhu De set up their little Soviet and then under pressure from uh, Chiang Kai-shek's expeditions, they eventually withdrew from there and made their long retreat into the Chinese Northwest, into their cave capital of Yan'an, where they spent the 1930s. Well, uh, of course, in 1936, Chiang Kai-shek is on the verge of continuing the operation against the communists, potentially wipe the communists out entirely. Uh, then there's this uh, Xi'an incident that takes place. And uh, Stalin, uh, just to summarize that for you, uh, what happened was uh, um, one of uh, Chiang's generals effectively arrests him uh, and you know, insists on having a united front with the communists in order to oppose the Japanese. When the Chinese communists hear about this, you know, they think actually for the first, the first idea that they have is to kill Chiang Kai-shek, but, but Stalin insists on a united front between the communists and the uh, nationalist government in order to oppose the Japanese. Because from Stalin's perspective, the best thing you can have is China fighting the Japanese so that the Soviet security is protected. So Stalin insisted on insisting on the united front between the Chinese communists and the, and the Guomindang or the nationalists is not at all some kind of a new measure or it's not a sign of altruism at all. He's interested in, in the protection of Soviet security in Siberia, and he's trying to prevent the Japanese from invading the Soviet Union in the East. Therefore, get the Chinese to fight them. Of course, what we have in 1937 is the Marco Polo Bridge incident and the beginning of the Sino-Japanese War in earnest. Stalin kind of at that point, and of course, after 1939, after the Battle of uh, Hulk and Gold, Stalin it can, can, um, can feel more secure still. It was in April 1941 that he manages to conclude the uh, a neutrality pact with the Japanese foreign minister who turns up in Moscow, foreign minister Matsuoka meets with Stalin. They conclude a neutrality pact, which reassures Stalin that his far eastern flank would be protected, just as, of course, things are unraveling. Well, they have been unraveling in Europe. And in fact, there's a war in Europe already going on. Stalin protects his backside, as it were, even as he faces Nazi Germany on the other side. So that's in, you know, that's in, in, in a nutshell what is happening here before the uh, Second World War truly gets the Soviet Union involved, which of course happens uh, in June 1941, when the Soviet Union is invaded by Nazi Germany. Now, as the war rages in the world and in Europe, and the Soviets are pushed back and then pushed back against the Germans. By 1943, the tide of war starts clearly to change. Well, after really the Battle of Stalingrad, the tide of war has already changed. And then you've got the Battle of Kursk. So the Soviets are pushing back. In Asia, Stalin still tries to deal with his problems of security and insecurity. He's tr still trying to understand how to approach Asia and China, which is the big question for Asia from the you know, perspective of the uh, post-war settlement. And before the settlement is arranged, he had different ideas about dealing with different parts of Asia. So I'll give you a few examples of how he approached the so-called you know, Chinese question. One, one approach was simply to annex territory. Why was annexation so useful for Stalin? Well, because he believed in security as, um, as a, 
function of territorial space. The more space you had, the more secure you felt because if somebody tries to invade you, then you would have time to regroup. You could have time for strategic uh, retreat, etc. So that's why he values this whole idea of, of, of buffers, etc. Um, in 1944, he annexes Tuva, which had people never talk about Tuva. You know, nobody even heard about Tuva. A few people have heard about Tuva, but Tuva was an independent, quote unquote, independent country uh, that existed there in, in, uh, in, in um, the depth of inner Asia in the interwar period. Just on this map, if you wonder where Tuva is, I'll show you. It's this bit here. Ah, there we go. See this bit here that is now part of Russia. Um, this was part of the Qing Empire back when, a long time ago. Eventually, you know, Tuva, Stalin tried to set it up as an independent uh, republic or something like that. In October 1944, he simply decided to annex it, make it a part of the Soviet, Soviet Union. And here it is, it's still a part of Russia. Did you know that the Russian defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, is from Tuva? One little fun fact, as it were. So Tuva was an example of where Stalin actually annexed a part of territory. And uh, so it Sovietized, it was Sovietized, it was annexed, it was fully incorporated in the Soviet, into the Soviet Union. But there were other instances where he could um, establish, he, he, would, he would not annex a territory, but he would Sovietize a territory. And the, the key example of that was Mongolia, which one which was uh, which fell under the Soviet influence already in uh, 1921. In fact, Mongolia, Outer Mongolia, uh, as the Chinese called it, Mongolia was proclaimed independence from China in 1911. But the Chinese, there was a kind of a period there between 1911 and 1921 when the Chinese tried to make their uh, presence felt and they tried to reclaim Mongolia for themselves making use of the revolutionary unrest in Russia. But by 1921, Mongolia fell back under uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet Russian influence, uh, Bolshevik influence. And uh, um, then already in 1930s, the Soviets basically carried out Sovietization in Mongolia, killing the Lamas, uh, carrying out um, uh, collectivization and things like that. So for most intents and purposes, it turned into Soviet Republic, but Stalin did not annex it. So that's the difference with, with Tuva, I guess, you know, there, there was, there was a nuance there. Or here's another approach that Stalin take, took in 1940s. And here we're talking again about approaches to bufferization of China. So to, as to, to give Stalin greater security and the Soviet Union greater security. Well, another approach was to sponsor eth an ethnic insurgency. And guess where he sponsored an ethnic insurgency? Uh, unsurprisingly, in Xinjiang. So this is where in the mid 1940s, well, starting really from 1943 in a major kind of way, there was an ethnic insurgency that was spearheaded by the Uyghurs with some Kazakhs as well, and then you know, some other uh, local nationalities, but mainly Uyghurs and the Kazakhs, uh, supported by Stalin, not just politically supported, but also supported through supply of weapons and even Soviet instructors and even Soviet soldiers. They were all fighting an undeclared war in Xinjiang directed against central Chinese nationalist government at a time when you still have the Second World War. You see how it's interesting, you know, Stalin has various cards in, in, in the play here. I mean, of course, Chiang Kai-shek fully realized what's going on there, that the Soviets are actually fighting a war in Xinjiang. So Stalin continued fighting this war until 1945. I'll say in a second what happened there, why the war was brought to an end. So that was another potential uh, card to play. That is also similar, by the way, to the card that Stalin played in northern Iran, if you're familiar with that Cold War crisis, that again followed the Second World War, where the Soviets sponsored a breakaway republic in northern Iran because there were some local, um, the local ethnicity in northern Iran, the Azeris, were very similar to the Azeris that were living across the border in Soviet Azerbaijan. And so using that card, Stalin uh, pr promoted a, a, a breakaway movement there, which uh, Jamil Hassan Lee has written extensively about if you're interested in that kind of subject. So you can see there are parallels between what he's doing in China, what he's doing, for example, in Iran around the same time. Finally, Stalin, of course, had his had its special relationship with Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese Communist Party 
um, was in fact brought together and established with Soviet support back in 1921. So the Soviets had been there at the creation, as it were, and supported the Communist Party in various ways and advised it in, in various ways. And some of that advice was exceptionally bad, leading to obliteration of the Chinese Communist Party and, or near obliteration in 1927. But throughout the 1930s, this, uh, the Soviets also managed to maintain some kind of contact with the Chinese Communists. And uh, because the, com the Communist Party was part of Comintern, until, of course, Comintern was um, dismissed, uh, they had to take instructions from the Soviets along party line. So Mao Zedong, in theory, was supposed to follow, even after Comintern was done away with, Mao Zedong was supposed to follow what Stalin told him because, well, look, he had to defer to communist number one. Yeah, communist number one is sitting in Moscow. Stalin has to defer, defer to, to his decisions. So you can see the multitude of Soviet approaches to Asia at this crucial moment in the mid 1940s, from outright annexation to Sovietization without annexation, to sponsor an ethnic insurgencies, to simply uh, maintaining this kind of contact with, uh, with Mao. And of course, uh, the Soviet Union all the while had a relationship with China, the nationalist government that at that time is based in Chongqing, the military capital in Chongqing. Very complex scenario for Stalin. Again, the key purpose here is to create a series of buffer states and expand Soviet security space in Asia so as to protect the soft, soft Soviet underbelly that, that I explained if you look at this map, yeah? Right, so then comes February 1945, the Yalta Conference. And the decisions that were taken there at the Yalta Conference between Stalin, American President Roosevelt and the British Prime Minister Churchill helped reshape Soviet policy, not just globally, but specifically and importantly towards Asia. So a couple of important decisions were taken there that were of consequence to Asia. First of all, Stalin agreed to participate in the war against Japan. This was not a given because, of course, he had the neutrality pact with Matsuoka going back to April 1941, but he really wanted to. He didn't have to be persuaded. I mean, come on. This was an opportunity to get to be late to this particular party, but a party that promised some dividends in the form of uh, concessions from the Americans to the Soviets in the Far East. And those were the concessions that Stalin demanded his, as a price for, for his entry. And Roosevelt was willing to oblige. Why? We can debate uh, about that. But I, you know, that, you know, from Roosevelt's perspective, it was okay, I guess, to give away some Japanese territory uh, or make some concessions at China's expense uh, if the Soviets participated in the war against Japan and therefore uh, brought an early conclusion to the war so that the Americans did not have themselves to, to um, land in Japan and uh, it would be less costly, American lives would be saved. Now, the atomic project, of course, made all of that somewhat irrelevant, but Roosevelt could not be assured of the success of the atomic project because that did not come until later. So, in Yalta, Stalin says, okay, we'll get involved in the war against Japan if, if we get something, some concessions like the Kuril Islands here. Some of you, of course, would know that Kuril Islands, or at least, you know, this islands down here, the southern, southern four islands, as they're called, um, are still disputed between Russia and Japan. That's the reason they still do not have a, a treaty for, <clears throat> that would put an end to the Second World War. So that goes back to those decisions of Yalta Conference. That's 19, that's, um, uh, that's a figure in 1945, uh, Southern Sakhalin, Stalin wanted that back, he got that. Um, crucially, he gets something like, something he calls status quo for Mongolia. Now that becomes actually very tricky later on because uh, what he meant by status quo for Mongolia in Yalta was that Mongolia would be truly independent and that China would have to acknowledge that independence, which eventually Chiang Kai-shek is forced to do. So finally, that actually happens. And, um, and, and so what, what is important about the Yalta Agreement is that it had American blessing, an American blessing. And for Stalin, and that shows actually a very interesting side of Stalin's personality, it was sometimes better to have smaller gains that would be recognized by the West. So therefore, if they're recognized, they're legitimated. 
than to have bigger gains that would not be recognized by the West. So they would not be legitimated. So he valued this recognition. He valued Western legitimacy. He valued the post-war order that they were supposed to be constructing at Yalta. And he was willing to make certain concessions to do that. For example, you know, what kind of concessions did Stalin make? Well, this became very clear during the negotiations in the summer of 1945 between Chiang Kai-shek and uh, rather, not directly Chiang Kai-shek, it was uh, Sun tzu <clears throat> the uh, Chinese prime minister, and Stalin in Moscow. The reason this negotiation came about in the summer of 1945 was that uh, it had to, it was kind of a consequence of the Yalta conference. Chiang Kai-shek had not been a part of party to the Yalta conference, but because so many decisions of the Yalta conference actually concerned the Far East and Asia, um, he had to work it out with Stalin later. So Stalin had the Chinese prime minister come over to Moscow and they had very nasty, very drawn out, difficult discussions. What was the difficulty? Well, Stalin of course said, we want independence for Mongolia. The Chinese said, well, we cannot do that. This way, if we do that, we will, our whole government, you know, the people will turn on us because this has been a part of China for 300 years. How can we give it up? And Stalin said, well, you're not, you don't even control it. How can you not give it up? That's just ridiculous. So there was this back and forth in Moscow. Finally, Chiang Kai-shek let his prime minister know that he could give up on Mongolia in exchange for certain things. And the key things the key things that Chiang Kai-shek wanted was he wanted Stalin to stop support for the insurgency in Xinjiang, this Uyghur insurgency that was going on and the Kazakh insurgency. That's one important condition. And the other important condition was that he, um, he wanted uh, Stalin to stop supporting Mao Zedong, the Chinese communist leader. And uh, well, you know, Stalin agreed to this. Stalin actually agreed to this because as I say, as I just said just now, for him having a, a legalized system with American blessing um, that would guarantee Soviet gains in Asia was more important than having uh, just as, as much as he could grab and carry because this would not have the legitimacy. So Stalin valued legitimacy. Stalin valued this kind of recognition by the Americans, by the Chinese nationalist government, et cetera. And how do we know that he was willing to give up uh, on his uh, rebellion in, in Xinjiang? Well, he actually did, right? After that uh, treaty of alliance was, was signed between China and the uh, Soviet Union, October, uh, rather August 14th, 1945, after that, Stalin essentially withdraws support for the uh, for those rebels and insurgents in Xinjiang, um, and their whole movement collapses. And with the result that we know today, I mean, this was the one moment. By the way, they were very close to actually claiming. In fact, they basically took over power in northern Xinjiang when Stalin pulled the plug on them. This was the only realistic time in recent history where the uh, so-called East Turkestan or Xinjiang had the prospect of becoming independent from China with Stalin's support in 1945 until Stalin pulled the plug because he traded it for some other things. Yeah, traded for Mongolia, which was better. And how do we know that he withdrew his support from Mao Zedong? Well, he actually sent the cable to Chairman Mao, saying, Chairman Mao, you know, Mao, dear comrade Mao Zedong, fly to Chongqing and negotiate coalition government, a coalition government with Chiang Kai-shek. Mao was horrified by this. What? Fly to Chongqing? What if, you know, Chiang Kai-shek shoots the plane down? So he actually got the American ambassador uh, to come out with him and sit on the same plane because he was so afraid that, the, that Chiang Kai-shek would shoot down the plane. But Stalin made it very clear that he wanted Mao Zedong to negotiate a coalition government. And what, what happened afterwards, of course, yeah, there was a, some kind of agreement um, between the two sides. In fact, there was a realistic chance at that point. Um, well, what Mao wanted in Chongqing, he, he wanted to divide China into halves and uh, uh, where, you know, the part of northern China would be under communist control. And uh, Chiang Kai-shek did not want to allow that. So in the end, there was some kind of agreement, but it fell apart. Um, unraveled very rapidly and China descended into civil war. So for all of Stalin's effort to get Mao Zedong into coalition government with Chiang Kai-shek, it's like that Chinese saying, you could not have two tigers on one mountain. Yeah, they will eat each other no matter what. And in this case, Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek were the two tigers and Stalin was really an external player there and had limited recourse, limited opportunity. 
uh, in between, you know, once the Chinese Civil War really broke out, um, and up to uh, up to about 1947, Stalin sort of played both sides. And that was very clear in Manchuria, where he allowed the Guomindang forces to come into Manchuria, uh, the Chinese nationalist forces, to occupy the cities. Now, the, all of Manchuria was under Soviet control. The Soviet military were there. But he allowed the, uh, uh, the uh, nationalist forces to occupy the cities, even as he allowed the communists to roam freely in the countryside. And the communists were eventually also supplied uh, with Japanese weapons that the Soviets confiscated from the Japanese and were provided, given some food stuff and, and other um, material support across the border. So Stalin really had his eggs in various baskets. So he was a very um, tricky operator. And uh, if you put yourself in his shoes, which I wouldn't recommend, but if you, if you think about how he was thinking about the um, uh, geopolitical situation in China, it's not so difficult to understand why he was being so careful because he did not nobody could have imagined the chinese communists would win in the civil war i mean the fact that it happened was a huge surprise to stalin he thought that they would be defeated by chiang kai-shek who on paper had such much greater forces but in the end of course chiang kai-shek's forces unraveled his whole country his whole leadership was plagued by economic problems and you know factionalism and that there's corruption there and all sorts of problems and fundamentally chiang kai-shek had to take responsibility for the for the for the mess that China was after years and years of the war against Japan and internal strife, by the by the late 1940s, China was in a huge mess. And so, of course, who who had to take responsibility? Chiang Kai-shek. So his leadership was uh, was already on uh, was already uh, falling apart, and the Chinese communists were able to capitalize on this and recapture China from him. He was pushed out to the island of Taiwan, where he remained. Uh, Chinese communists were never able to take over Taiwan. Now, with that, we come to an important turning point in the Sino-Soviet relationship. And here we're, we're, uh, we're about 1949, where in 1949, Mao Zedong already established control, de facto control over much of China, except for, you know, Tibet and, Xinj uh, Tibet and Xinjiang, which would come under Chinese control later in 1950 and 1951. But for much of the rest of China is already in his hands. He is looking for an alliance with the Soviet Union. Stalin tried to postpone Mao's trip to Moscow for a long time under various silly pretexts like, oh, there's nobody in Moscow at the moment because we're all the leading comrades are busy with harvest work and stuff like that. Um, you know, those that, that was one, one example. Uh, but in the end, he couldn't resist anymore. And Mao Zedong actually turned up in Moscow in December 1949. And they had a, 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 a serious conversation with Stalin, which some of which well, we have and we have had for some years and some of them have disappeared or were never recorded to begin with. Uh, but in any case, the, the general outline of what happened is well known. When Mao first turned up in Moscow and had his first conversation with Stalin, Stalin said, we're not going to change. You know, Mao wanted a new Treaty of Alliance. And Stalin said, we're not changing the Treaty of Alliance. And we'll have to uh, maintain our old treaty with Kuomintang, which was concluded in August 1945. Mao was deeply disappointed by that. But eventually, a few weeks later, coming, uh, uh, Stalin turned around and uh, decided that, after all, he could give Mao a new treaty, uh, a new treaty of alliance, which uh, historians have been trying to understand for years and years and years what happened, why Stalin changed his mind, and why he decided to finally embrace Mao after all those years of suspicion and for all those years of double dealing and keeping his eggs in different baskets. Various versions have been aired. Um, uh, the pre pre you know, Mao's own preferred version was that Stalin was terrified that China would turn towards the West. In fact, when in one of the conversations that took place in Moscow around that time, Mao hinted to one of Stalin's lieutenants that uh, if um, you know, that, Mao, that China was already in, in establishing relations with Burma and India and might actually turn towards Great Britain as well. And that supposedly scared Stalin. I don't know. I don't fully buy that. But why, why, one way or another, perhaps Stalin realized at this point that really the civil war had been won and there was no more 
uh, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't temporize. You had to just embrace Mao as he was, which uh, Stalin did. And in February 1950, of course, the Soviet Union and China concluded their famous or infamous Treaty of Alliance. Um, they became, you know, this was a turning point in the global Cold War. The Soviet Union acquired this massive ally. Now, Stalin also got some gains from China that were probably unnecessary. He was just kind of greedy in, in some ways, and he kept pushing Mao when maybe he should have not pushed Mao. For example, on this question of um, joint enterprises in China, which Mao felt violated Chinese sovereignty, uh, this whole idea of, of keeping Manchuria as um, an exclusive sphere of Soviet interests really annoyed Mao greatly. He didn't like that idea at all. Uh, this idea of transfer of the right, the Soviet right to transfer troops through China uh, to supply their base in Dalian, the port right here. You can see Port Arthur. This is where the Soviets got their base under the previous treaty with Chiang Kai-shek. Now uh, Stalin wanted the right to transport troops there. And the Chinese thought, well, you know, this violates our sovereignty. So they proposed a different clause. They said, well, in this case, we will want to transport, transfer Chinese troops through the territory of the Soviet Union. And the Soviets were like, well, where do, you, where do you want to transfer your troops? That doesn't make any sense. And the Chinese said, well, John Lai, that time Chinese prime minister said, well, you know, let's say we want to transfer our troops to uh, Xinjiang. Then we can go across the Soviet territory just like this, just like this, and we get to Xinjiang. And of course, the Soviet negotiators thought that it was preposterous for the Chinese to propose that what they didn't get, or maybe they did get, but didn't want to admit it, was that it was a, for China, which was, of course, you know, the Chinese Communist Party narrative was based on this whole idea of overcoming century of foreign humiliation and standing up. Uh, you know, we, the Chinese people, have stood up, Mao Zedong proclaimed on September 21st, 1949. This idea of giving Soviets some kind of quasi-imperial privileges was not an idea that they liked very much, but they had to agree to that, which is one, why some historians argue that the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Alliance had already seeds of its own demise, of its own disintegration, because it was, it was unequal and it was kind of quasi it guaranteed Soviet quasi Soviet quasi imperial privileges, but other historians and here I'm thinking in particular of Shen Zhihua, the Chinese historian who's written extensively about it, actually argues that Mao Zedong benefited tremendously benefited tremendously from this treaty, which not only brought Soviet security umbrella for China, uh, thereby guaranteeing that or, or assuring that the Americans would not intervene in the Chinese civil war that was very important for Mao, but also gave a lot of economic aid to China and indeed the Soviet economic program of aid extended in the 1950s and the Soviets actually helped create modern Chinese industry, including of course military industry and prom you know, prominently the, so uh, the Chinese atomic project was very, a very important part of the program. So China benefited economically, benefited in terms of high tech uh, that was brought in from the Soviet Union militarily. And the most importantly, China had now, Mao got face. He could stand up and say, yes, I am Stalin's comrades. You know, we're Stalin and I are comrades. And uh, uh, this gave Mao a sense of legitimacy. So legitimacy is very important for him as well. So basically it's a mixed bag. Yeah, Mao got a lot out of this alliance. And uh, you could also argue that yes, and as Mao did later, that Mao, that Stalin never trusted Mao, and that planted seeds for uh, subsequent problems in the in this relationship. Right. So the alliance lasted approximately. I mean, in in, in technically, it lasted until 1979. But of course, we know that by 1959, the alliance was as good as dead for most intents and purposes because China and the Soviet Union quarreled very badly. And the quarrel, the roots of that quarrel. Well, I mean, you can again, you could you could claim that some of those roots were planted already in 1949 or seeds were planted and roots go back to that period. But others would say that actually for the first few years, the alliance was working quite well, as for example, the Soviet Chinese collaboration in the, in the Korean War showed very well. But then when we get to 1956, problems develop. And uh, uh, depending on what you argue, what your argument is in this historiography on Sino-Soviet relations, some argue that this was this moment of 1956 was really a key turning point uh, because of ideological shift in the Soviet Communist Party, which was brought about by Khrushchev's 
February 1956, secret speech where he denounced Stalin. Now, um, denunciation of Stalin uh, had broad ramifications for global strategy in the Cold War. So for example, uh, Khrushchev's pursuit of peaceful coexistence was kind of a consequence of his denunciation of Stalin, because Stalin, of course, insisted that war was inevitable, but Khrushchev thought, no, you cannot, you cannot have inevitable war with the West, especially not at this age of nuclear weapons. We have to peacefully coexist. So that's one, one aspect, one facet of this. Um, another facet was that in the late 1950s, the Soviets started moving, started peddling this idea that you could actually have uh, a transfer to socialism without a communist revolution. So you could, uh, communists could kind of vote themselves into power. Um, this was called peaceful road to socialism. And uh, again, this is something that Stalin would probably have disagreed with. And Mao Zedong bitterly disagreed with. So Mao Zedong not only criticized the Soviets for criticizing Stalin, Mao Zedong actually recognized that Stalin made mistakes, but from Mao Zedong's perspective, the mistakes that Stalin made were just those mistakes where he dealt badly with China. Those were Stalin's mistakes. As for the rest, Stalin was a great Marxist-Leninist, those are Mao's words. And as Mao had put it, uh, out of Stalin's 10 fingers, three, three fingers, yeah, three fingers were bad, rotten fingers, the rest were great. So it's a 70, it's a 70-30 ratio or three to seven finger ratio. So three fingers of Stalin were bad, seven fingers were good, not like Khrushchev said, which everything that Stalin did was really terrible, et cetera, et cetera. So, and of course, you know, there's a personal element here as well. Khrushchev over, overthrew Stalin's legacy, but Mao, you could argue, was China's Stalin. Therefore, Mao also felt that he was under pressure from this whole de-Stalinization thing in the USSR. So you can argue that there was this ideological dimension to the relationship that then evolved and evolved and evolved and led to the Sino-Soviet split. The one historian who argues this very convincingly, in my opinion, is Lawrence Luthi, who is, of course, authored a book on uh, the Sino-Soviet split. Cold War in the Communist World. Uh, he emphasizes the ide ideological aspect. You can, um, uh, you know, I, I buy this, but I, I not entirely because here's my problem with this argument. It seems that when it came to actual practical policy, that the Soviets and the Chinese were often on the same page, and this is what Khrushchev recognized. Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. He thought, okay, you know, the Chinese are saying that we should not say that war is inevitable, but do the Chinese really want, rather the Chinese are saying that we should not say that peaceful, co that we should have peaceful co co coexistence, that Stalin thought that war is, war is inevitable, but do they really want war? Or, you know, they, they surely they must realize that in a nuclear age, you cannot have war. So Khrushchev doubted that there was real divergence there in terms of uh, inevitability of war. And then he would say, well, the Chinese are saying that we're not helping enough the revolutionary world, but actually we are helping the revolutionary world. So for example, in Cuba and you know, various other places, we are helping revolutionary forces. So clearly this is not the reason. So Khrushchev thought that ideology was not the reason they had a split with China. There had to be something else. And Khrushchev came up with this idea that actually the, the, real, the real reason for the Sino-Soviet divergence was that the Chinese were trying to take over the mantle of leadership in the, in the communist world from the Soviet Union. And there's something to it because Mao Zedong did not, he of course realized that China was quite backward, but he felt that he was much greater revolutionary and his credentials were much better than Khrushchev's. I mean, who was Khrushchev? He was just a clown in Stalin's court, whereas Mao, he led a whole country to revolutionary victory in civil war. Uh, so therefore, uh, Mao felt that he could define the strategy for the communist world. He could uh, be the, uh, the strategist in chief, as it were, for this alliance and for the broader socialist camp. And Khrushchev was not willing to give him this place. So in many ways, you can see this, the Sino-Soviet disagreement and divergences as a, a kind of a function of power struggle between Mao and Khrushchev, but also broader struggle for leadership between the Soviet Union and China, who will be at the top. That's why I, I called my book uh, that I, I wrote about the subject, 
two suns in the heavens, because there's a Chinese saying, you cannot have two suns in the heavens and you cannot have two kings on earth. In the context of the socialist camp, China was making claim to leadership. The Soviets were making claim to leadership and they just could not coexist. Again, we go back to this Chinese saying of, you know, no two tigers on one mountain. So that's another possible explanation that downplays ideology and that highlights more of the kind of a personal bid for leadership uh, hierarchy of the socialist, socialist um, uh, international communist movement and so on and so forth. One way or another, the Sino-Soviet relationship fell apart in the 19, starting from 1950, late 1950s and early into the early 1960s. It really exploded. There was a polemic between them. They, they, um, they accused each other of all kinds of terrible, terrible sins. Um, the Soviets accused China of dogmatism. The Chinese accused uh, the Soviets of betraying the revolution and of, uh, um, uh, of selling out to imperialism and, and so on and so forth, um, which reminds me of a joke. There was a joke at that time, um, which was, uh, so somebody calls up the radio station and asks, can you tell, um, uh, well, you know, how do we know that the earth is round? That the earth, the earth is round. And the, 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 the answer from the radio station, well, this is because all the all the crap that we pour in the direction of the west comes back at us from the east meaning from china so this was the kind of general sentiment in the in the um uh you know at the time right rousseau was ousted in 1964 i know i'm running out of time so i'll try to be very brief and we have brezhnev who um who comes to power there there is a brief moment there in the mid 1960s to try to repair the relationship Alexei Kasigin the prime minister goes to Beijing meets with Mao Zedong says you know why are we quarreling okay Khrushchev maybe you had some personality issues with Khrushchev and you know Khrushchev we got rid of him so surely now there's got to be you know we we should we should repair relations between we are communists and you're communists and communists should should be friends we should be on the same page and Mao Zedong told Kasigan no our struggle will continue for 10,000 years and Kasigan said well 10,000 years that's a long time can't we shorten it and um and Mao said, well, I'll take off 1,000 years, but that's as much as I can go. Our struggle will continue for 9,000 years, which, of course, you know, left Kasigin very disappointed. He came back to, to Moscow, and the struggle did continue for not for quite that long, but it, it worsened, intensified, which, by the way, reminds me to mention the argument that Chen Jian, uh, Chinese historian, Chinese-American historian Chen Jian makes, which I think is a very powerful argument, and that is to understand the Sino-Soviet split as a function, as a byproduct of Chinese domestic power struggles, or Ch also Mao's ideological, domestic uh, ideological campaign. So there's a domestic component to this. Mao Zedong does not want to improve relations with the Soviet Union because he feels that if he does, this will empower his domestic opponents. And indeed, in uh, 1966, Mao Zedong launches the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, uh, which has a very strong anti-Soviet angle. So at that point, improving relations with the USSR is a, is a non-starter because he will then, you know, how can you do that? That's the whole underpinning of the, of the Cultural Revolution is, that, um, is to prevent Soviet-style revisionists from coming to power in China. So you could not improve relations with the USSR at that time. So this is just a domestic component. That's something I thought I should mention. Finally, the relationship continues to, deter to, to worsen until in 1969, the two countries nearly go to war. In fact, they fight an undeclared war across their border. So what happens there is the Chinese attack um, uh, at Junbaodao Island uh, on the, uh, March, uh, the night of March 2nd, March, March 3rd. The Soviets retaliate a few weeks later, a couple of weeks later, there's another big fight at the border. And uh, as far as we can tell, actually thousands of Chinese, you know, the Chinese never re released the uh, casualty figures for that, but maybe up to a thousand Chinese were killed by the artillery uh, strikes from the Soviet side of the border. So it comes really close. It becomes really, really nasty. And in fact, we know that this was um, that this was the moment, this warfare in Beijing was the moment that Mao decided to seek rapprochement with the United States because he realized that, uh, that he had to have a counterbalance on the other side, as it were, of the, um, you know, 
this war, the origins of the triangular diplomacy that, of course, comes about around, around this period. Right. The Soviet leader Brezhnev at that point de developed an acute fear of China. He felt that the Chinese could not be trusted. They were militant. They could, be, they could invade Siberia at any moment. And uh, this, in turn, actually underpinned Brezhnev's search for rapprochement um, and detente with the West. So his, his meeting with Nixon, for example, in May 1972, was in part underpinned by what was happening in Asia in his fear of China. What Brezhnev had in mind was a kind of a global condominium between the Soviet Union and the United States. The two countries would work together to solve all kinds of problems internationally, including China, which was for Brezhnev a huge problem, a huge security concern as well. Of course, we know that did not work out primarily because the Americans did not want to have this kind of condominium. The Americans were quite happy to actually play the two sides, the Soviets and the Chinese against one another, did it throughout the 1970s uh, with good results, they thought. Uh, but anyway, we know that Brezhnev was, of course, you know, deeply resented. He was really deeply fearful of China and wanted to have to build the, up the relationship with the Americans to counter China. It didn't work out for him. In fact, by the late 1970s, Soviet-American relations from a period of detente entered a period of renewed tension and crisis um, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, it started really already in the mid 70s or even early 70s with the qu question of Jewish immigration, uh, which deeply annoyed Brezhnev. Uh, because it showed the Americans trying to intervene in Soviet internal affairs. Uh, there was the jackson Bannock uh, Amendment that annoyed him and derailed Soviet-American trade. Then, of course, Jimmy Carter came into office and highlighted the whole human rights dimension of American foreign policy, which deeply annoyed Brezhnev as well. And then you had the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, followed by a crisis in Poland, where the Soviets did not invade. But the relationship by the early 1980s, the relationship between the Soviet Union and America was really bad, as, as bad as it had never been. So it is in this context that we have to understand the Soviet turn towards rapprochement with China, which can be traced back to March 1982, to Brezhnev's speech in uh, Tashkent, where he said that we're actually, we never, you know, we don't see the Chinese people as our enemy. We recognize, you know, China's unity and Taiwan as a part of China, et cetera, et cetera. And we're happy to improve relations. And at that time, the Chinese actually reciprocated because they also had their own problems with Americans, despite Deng Xiaoping reaching out to the Americans and normalizing relationship already by January 1979. Deng Xiaoping felt that there were problems in that relationship, and he felt that the tensions in Soviet-Chinese relations did not serve his purposes. So he actually reciprocated, and you had a process between 1982 and 1989 as the two sides came closer and closer together. This process started under Brezhnev, continued under Gorbachev until May 1989, when Mikhail Gorbachev turned up in Beijing to normalize relations with China. So Gorbachev, this is actually one of lasting legacies of Gorbachev's leadership in the Soviet Union. He actually brought an end to the Sino-Soviet uh, conflict. And it's very telling, by the way, that when during one of the meetings with the Chinese leaders, and actually meeting with Le Pen, who later became prime minister, Gorbachev, you know, Le Pen came over to Moscow and they had a conversation with Gorbachev. And, um, and Le Pen said, well, you know, we're happy to improve relations, but you have to understand we will never be, we will never be Soviet younger brother again. And Gorbachev said, yeah, good. That's good. We don't want to be your older brother. <laughs> That's fine. We'll have perfectly good relationship. And then, of course, when Gorbachev turned up in Beijing, there, you know, Beijing was a mess at that time because of uh, unrest in, in, in Tiananmen Square, protests, etc. But they had a conversation with Deng Xiaoping, and Deng Xiaoping said, during the Sino-Soviet confrontation, we had this period where you know we accused each other of all kinds of sins and the you know revisionism, dogmatism, etc. But you know this was not the problem. The problem, Deng Xiaoping said, that you did not treat us equally. And we felt like we were looked down upon. And I think Deng Xiaoping hit the nail on the head right there. Now, it is actually to Gorbachev's great credit that he tried to rebuild this relationship on the basis of complete equality. And the Chinese, of course, also embraced him for that reason, even though they did not like Gorbachev for a host of other reasons, not least for his reformist tendencies. So by 
the early 1990s then China and Russia were getting back together. And this movement was only briefly broken by the breakdown of the USSR and Yeltsin's, Yeltsin's Boris, Yel, Boris Yeltsin's brief flirtation with the West in 1992. But Yeltsin already was turning away from that. Even, he, even, even though he was talking about democracy and how Russian foreign policy would be underpinned by different kind of principles, still, he valued China, and eventually, of course, he traveled to China, and uh, Jiang Zemin, the Chinese uh, general secretary, also came to Moscow, and they established a close, a close rapport and close personal relationship, which laid the foundation for the strategic partnership that we still have between China and Russia today. So to conclude, today, both Xi Jinping and President Vladimir Putin say that their relationship is at historic best, which is probably about right, which is probably about right. The difference between today and different other method or different other points in the relationship is both sides recognized the sensitivity of each side to the question of hierarchy and really work hard to try to present themselves as on equal level. The Chinese at this point have not really made an effort to make the Russians feel that they're a junior partner in this alliance. Although in practical terms, of course, China is a much greater animal compared to Russia. Uh, the Chinese are being very diplomatic, uh, very careful with the Russians and do not really force their way in this relationship, perhaps learning from the mistakes of the past. The Russians, for their part, also remember the complicated, long, difficult history of the Sino-Soviet relationship and that the conflict that they had with the Chinese that came nearly to a point of a war in 1969 benefited no one except for the West. Therefore, they're working very hard to avoid this kind of situation from transpiring again. Russia and China have been neighbors for hundreds of years. Therefore, the idea there, you know, they've seen high and lows, but the idea now is to make sure that the relationship is close on its own terms. Uh, Russia and China need a close relationship no matter what happens in their foreign relations on other, in other aspects of their foreign relations, which brings, to this, brings us to this question. Does Russian relationship with China today, does it depend on what is happening in Russia's relationship with the West? Because some people will say, well, you know what, we are pushing the Russians too hard, therefore they're getting close to Beijing. I think this is, I think this is going too far. I think the Russians and the Chinese have their own reasons born of their difficult historical experience for having a good productive relationship today and even in the future, even if when, if and when Putin is replaced by somebody else who will try to rebuild relationship with the West, I do not think that Russia will turn its back to China because I think the Russians realize that they, that's a neighbor they have to court and that's a neighbor that is very, you know, it's inevitable for them. So a good relationship is essential. Okay, I'll leave it at this and uh, see if, if anybody has questions. Thank you very, very much for a fascinating talk. And uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, lots of questions. I know I, I have a few, but <laughs> I'll uh, try to shush and uh, to let uh, particularly the students uh, go ahead and ask. And of course, anyone else who may have a question. And it seems that uh, Sergey wants to jump in with the first one. And since he was the one who introduced you, we'll give him the honor. Sergey, please ask your question. Uh, as a human. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, lecture. It was uh, really uh, amazing and I uh, uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, actually I have uh, a lot of questions and uh, I will ask only two questions. Uh, my first question is that uh, you were talking about the relations uh, between two countries, but what about the people of two countries? And uh, what was the image of the Soviet Union among Chinese people? Did the relations between the, the, the two countries uh, have, an, uh, have an influence on the attitude? And uh, my second question is uh, that uh, you mentioned that Soviet Union once was an important uh, player in the inter-ethnic uh, relations in China. Uh, for example, it tried uh, to inspire uh, Uyghur nationalism between uh, 1949 
or after the relations between the two countries uh, deteriorated at the end of the 50s. And uh, does, Russia have, uh, does Russia have any uh, serious uh, influence on Chinese ethnic uh, minorities? Yes. Unmute myself. Okay, thank you, Sergey, for these questions. The, uh, for, for both are you know very interesting, very fascinating questions. Because when we talk about, for example, Russian relationship to 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 China, um, we can talk about the the leader leader to leader relationship. We can see, for example, today you can have one kind of relationship. Historically, you may have a different kind of relationship. But you know, this is a very in, the, in a way, this is a top-down look at the, at the, at the relationship. Um, uh, if you actually go to people-to-people -people relations, then it's a, sometimes it's a different story. So, for example, you could, um, uh, you could argue that, the, that there's still a great degree, uh, even you know, I'm talking about today's relationship, for example, you can still talk about the great degree of misunderstanding between the Russians and the Chinese, cultural misunderstanding, partly because I think the Russians see themselves basically as Europeans more than anything else. They look to the West more than they look to the East in cultural terms, in cultural terms. They may have a very bad relationship with the West, but this is still where they send their children to study. And well, that's where they try to, when they, you know, I'm talking about the oligarchs, et cetera, they siphon off money from the states and then they put it in the West, right? They don't put it in China. I think that's maybe starting to change because there's more and more um, interaction with uh, between the Russians and the Chinese in the Far East. But this was not the case for much of the Cold War. Um, at that time, the relationship was, even in the 1950s, when the, the, the alliance was supposed to be eternal and unbreakable, the human relationship was actually non-existent practically. There would be occasional tour groups and, you know, some people would go back and forth. Chinese students would come to Moscow uh, and, uh, you know, many of them experienced uh, um, uh, actually yeah, acts of chauvinism and and, and there would be lots of cultural misunderstanding, et cetera. And then after the relationship started to uh, worsen in the 1960s, those interactions stopped altogether. And there was very, very little that the two peoples even knew about one another. So I, I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation that I, I, I was born on the border between Russia and China. Did, did we know anything about the Chinese? Did we, you know, did we understand what's going on across the other side of the border? Absolutely not. Uh, there was very little interaction, very little interaction. That only started to change in the early 1990s when borders uh, opened up and uh, you had a lot of cross-border trade. Uh, uh, but again, certainly on the Russian side, there was great fear of uh, Chinese um, immigration and, and much of it, of course, um, not, uh, not particularly realistic. For the Chinese side as well, there's not there that you can, at the social level, it can also point to all kinds of cultural misunderstandings and cultural problems, as it were. So, as far as the first question is concerned, the second question was about the um, let's see, uh, minorities. He was asking minorities. Did they did, did the Soviets try to play the minorities card? That's an interesting question because there's this historical moment in 1962 when there's an uprising, uh, not uprising, sorry, um, a kind of um, cross-border incident where a bunch of Uyghurs pick up and cross over bo the border to Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. And um, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, historiography claims that this was Soviet inspired. So the Soviet consuls Consul in Xinjiang actually gave out uh, Soviet passports and encouraged people to leave China, uh, which 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 is seen as as a kind of uh, basically the Soviet you know as a part of an effort to undermine the Chinese at that time. But the Soviet side and the Russian side of the story is that the conditions, living conditions in Xinjiang were so bad that the Soviets didn't have to do anything. Those people were just fleeing across the border because, of course, of the great look forward and the 
and the chaos that that caused in China and the deprivation, et cetera. And they had brethren, their ethnic brethren living across the border in the Soviet side. So of course they just have to, you know, all they have to do is to go and pick up and, and, uh, uh, and just move over uh, to the other side of the border. Now, so there are two different historiog historiographical approaches here. And I would side here with the Russian historiography against the Chinese historiography. And that is because I've seen the Russian documents, especially the KGB documents, uh, indicating that the uh, large crossing of, of Uyghurs and others in 1962, May 1962, was a surprise for the Soviets. Uh, uh, not it was not something that the Soviets actually had planned or executed, etc. So, so, uh, so the Soviets, the Soviets did not. I, I think they they did not really at that point were playing play, playing the ethnic card the way they had, for example, under Stalin in 1943, 1945. Um, so that's that's in the answer to your second question. Does it? Do, did the, I cover? Do, yeah. And do, do they have any influence now on the in the Uyghur situation? Or? Well, no. I think now they don't have much of an influence. Uh, China is such a uh, such a such a big player there. China has all the influence now, and the Russians, of course, are increasingly willing to defer to China. And in fact, the Russian state state media is uh, is uh, re recycling Chinese propaganda on Xinjiang at the moment. So the latest state of affairs, if you follow what the Russians Russian state media is writing, is basically you know they're just recycling Chinese propaganda. Thank you. Um, Uli Rosenberg, you wrote uh, quite a few questions. Choose one and please turn on the mic and ask that one question. We will, it will be followed by Kunduz, who will have the chance to ask her question. Go ahead, Uli. Okay, thank you for a very interesting uh, lecture. I learned a lot from it. Uh, I'll choose maybe the first question, try to understand more the logic of the keeping Mongolia independent? Like what was the geopolitics? Like this is a very weak country and very big. I could see other ways of uh, maybe gobbling it up, but like other win-win situation between the Russians and, and, and Chinese. I don't understand why to keep such a great massive land, maybe it doesn't have a lot of resources, but still by two countries uh, that could easily take it and kind of split it. What's the logic here? That's that's a good question. I mean, in a way, they did split it because, of course, Mongolia includes Outer Mongolia, what the Chinese call Wai Mongol, and the Inner Mongolia, Nei Mongol. So, uh, Inner Mongolia was was populated by um, by ethnic Mongols, but it was more incorporated into China already since the times of the Qing Dynasty. And so, the Chinese continued to preserve control over this, whereas the Outer Mongolians were. Uh, they were under less control of the Chinese, and that's the reason that the Soviets were able to establish their control there after 1921. But in 1945, there actually was a moment where Chobalsan, the leader of Outer Mongolia, was uh, trying to extend his influence with Soviet support into Inner Mongolia and unite all of Mongolia under his control. In fact, he had this idea about having Great Mongolia, which would extend all the way to the Great Wall of China, or indeed maybe even to the sea. I mean, you could you could argue that this was a completely uh, harebrained idea, but uh, Stalin for a time seemed to be playing along with this. And in the uncertain environment of all of, of 1945, nobody could tell what exactly could happen. So the Soviets actually were playing the Mongol ethnic card for a while, but then they moved away from this idea uh, and uh, decided to simply retain Outer Mongolia, even as the Chinese would reassert their control over Inner Mongolia, which is what happened ultimately with the agreement of Chiang Kai-shek. Mao Zedong later tried to uh, reverse this agreement. And as late as 1956, Mao Zedong actually tr kept pushing the Soviets to surrender Mongolia so that um, it returns in it returns become part, becomes a part of China. And the Soviets, of course, did not want to do this. And the reason for that is as is strategic, obviously it's a buffer space. Uh, there's a lot of territory there. It's a territory that is that is easily crisp, that you can cross with tanks. Uh, and indeed, at the time of the Sino-Soviet confrontation, a whole Soviet army was stationed in Mongolia, uh, and much of it was concentrated at the southern border. And uh, uh, those tanks, that Soviet army, if they decided to invade China, they could be in Beijing in like two days. I've actually driven from Mongolia, from the border 
um, uh, across the Gobi Desert and into Beijing a few years ago. And that took me just a few hours actually, but I was driving a Jeep, not a tank. Uh, <laughs> although I did get us, I, I got stuck in a massive traffic jam. So that tripled my journey, but that just, you know, that's a sign of China's rapid development. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So, so there was no poll pol in a sense, there was a Polish scenario of, of them, of them divided, but dividing the country. But what's interesting is that the Soviets never tried to incorporate Mongolia and annex it like Stalin did, for example, in, in, in um, with Western, Western, um, uh, Ukraine and Western Belarus, which of course was old Eastern Poland. Uh, and that is despite the fact that Mongolian leadership repeatedly, I'm not talking about Chobolson, Chobolson was very nationalistic, but the guy who followed Chobolson in 1952 was a guy called Yum Shagin Sedenbal, and Sedenbal actually repeatedly raised the question with the Soviets about annexation of Mongolia. And the Soviets said, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We will not do that. Why? Why did Stalin turn him down? Why did the Soviets continue to turn him down even after Stalin's death? I don't know. I guess. I don't, I don't know. I guess they, they were worried about international repercussions. Like people would say, oh, look at it. Look at the Soviet Union. They're this, uh, you know, um, aggressive empire that is gobbling up its neighbor. So maybe that's the reason. Thank you. Uri, we will uh, maybe get back to you if we have more time later on for more questions. But now, Kunduz. Uh, hello to everyone. Thank you, Sergey, for your question. Uh, it was very interesting that you spoke about a uh, great game. Uh, and uh, I think uh, its uh, continuity could be noticed also in nowadays, I guess, in that Central Asia territory. So what would you say about uh, Sino-Russian uh, Sino tension on the um, domination in this, especially border conflicts and plus economic <laughs> dominance? Yeah. Thank you, Kunduz. That's, that's, that's a very good question that has to do with really the current state of the relationship. And, and here, a lot of observers of Sino-Russian relations have been really, um, have been, uh, surprised by the fact that we have not had so far any kind of a major fallout between China and Russia over Central Asia. Now, to explain briefly, Russia, of course, sees Central Asia as its zone of special influence and interest, uh, um, uh, economic, political especially. But if you look at the amount of Chinese investment, especially after the um, uh, Silk Road Initiative, which was, of course, proclaimed by Comrade Xi Jinping precisely in Kazakhstan in 2013, and that has you know, since evolved into uh, BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, you can see that there's a massive investment economically into those countries, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the question then is, can the Russians reconcile themselves to inevitable loss of economic influence? And doesn't that, wouldn't that mean that they would, you know, China and Russia would somehow end up in conflict? A lot of observers actually predicted that this would happen already in the early 2000s. And it hasn't happened. In fact, the Russians and the Chinese were, have been able to work out uh, a kind of a way of deconflicting their two integrationist projects. For China, it's BRI. For the Russians, it's the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, they have been able to work it out. And uh, uh, I guess, you know, a part of the reason, you know, they, they have been able to also work together in the context of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which basically serves to deconflict the two sides and their interests in Central Asia. And that goes back to this question that I alluded to in my conclusion. I think both sides realize that nobody would stand to benefit from their relationship going sour except for the West. So they work very carefully. The Chinese are working very carefully to make sure they don't step too much on Russian toes. And the, Russian are also, the Russians are also graciously allowing the Chinese influence to increase in Central Asia, half assuming that anyway, the Central Asians will not be too keen on Chinese cultural penetration and they'll push back on their own account. Yeah, they'll push back on their own account because they like Russia more than China. There's kind of the, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, assumed um, uh, rationale there. So anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a sensitive area to continue watching, but so far so good. It has not, 
uh, it has not led to major um, major falling out between Russia and China. Thanks, and that's assuming that the Central Asians uh, have a particular affinity to either side. But, uh, mm, yeah, yeah. Like, the after, after the, the like conflict the with Tajikistan now, uh, in recent conflict, I think, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you know, we've had, a, and the Chinese, of course, are also burning, uh, uh, starting to, um, uh, uh, you know, they're burning their fingers in some of those, in some of those areas as well. Uh, when they, when there's sometimes resentment against Chinese workers, um, sometimes they push their luck too much with their assertive foreign policy. Uh, there has been, for example, um, there have been instances. Well, this uh, Chinese diplomats in Kazakhstan, for example, have been famous for making all kinds of diplomatic faux pas and uh, outraging uh, the Kazakh intel in, you know, in, in intellectuals and the broader kind of community with their lack of um, lack of um, what's the word lack of cultural understanding. So in other words, it's, it's, it's an interesting situation for China. And I think the Chinese are being very careful at this point. Thank you. So uh, now we have uh, Jesse Weinberg. And after Jesse, uh, we'll ask his question. And the reply, I will uh, read uh, Tomer's question. Um, OK, so Jesse. Uh, thank you for your very enlightening uh, lecture. My question is regarding uh, Sino-Russo relations in Siberia. So um, as you previously described, uh, you mentioned Siberia and the Russian Far East as the sort of soft underbelly of, um, of Russia. Considering uh, substantial demographic changes within Russia, declining population, uh, low life expectancy, etc., and growing Chinese investment within Siberia, as well as um, growing ethnic Chinese migration into Siberia. How do you see that playing out in the coming decades? Uh, and what do you think the influence would be on, on uh, Sino-Russo relations? Well, that's a, that's a very good question, Jesse. I mean, uh, it, there's been a lot of um, alarm about this, uh, much of it unjustified. The, the alarm was already in the 1990s. Well, the alarm was there throughout the period. In fact, in, uh, in 19... Uh, 1955, when Adenauer met with uh, Nikita Khrushchev, Adenauer, I think at that point, told Khrushchev, aren't you afraid of the yellow peril? And Khrushchev said, we don't recognize such things. You know, we're Marxist Leninists. What are you talking about? Uh, and then Khrushchev himself, of course, became quite afraid in the 19, uh, uh, ni early 1960s uh, to the point of actually taking over some of that vocabulary. But um, uh, in the 1990s, there was a lot of conversation about, especially in the Russian Far East, which is where I hail from, about the opening borders and uh, about Chinese immigration and how that was um, particularly dangerous for Russia with its underpopulated Far East, as people, of course, Russian ethnic Russians flee from the Far East because of uh, poor climatic conditions and whatnot. By and large, this has not happened this has not happened, and uh, there still is no mass Chinese migration into the Far East in Siberia. Um, a friend of mine, a, a, a Chinese, I, I guess he's a billionaire, really, really, you know, a tycoon, as it were, but we had a conversation. And, uh, you know, his family is uh, largely based in part of them in California, part of them in Vancouver, and, and uh, you know, he said, he said, why, uh, uh, why is there this talk about the Chinese trying to migrate to Siberia? Uh, uh, you know, why, why, wouldn't we, yeah, I would, uh, why would we want to go there when I, we can go to Vancouver? <laughs> much better life there, much better life. So I think in, in many ways, it's, it's, uh, the certainly migration problem is overstated. The uh, problem that is not overstated is Chinese investment in um, resources, uh, exploitation on the Russian side of the border, and how that has led to protests and recriminations and tensions. That has already happened um, because of the, partly because of, of just this whole idea of the Chinese using, you know, extracting those resources, and part of the way it's done with local corruption contributing to the problems, et cetera. So uh, this is an, an area to uh, pay attention to, but I would, not, I, would not, um, I would not say that at the moment it's a really hugely sensitive issue. 
for the Russians. I think even Russian attitude towards the Chinese has even started to improve in recent years uh, in general, as uh, they don't actually see the Chinese at the kind of a social level as the threat, the way that many, certainly in the Russian Far East, perceived them in the 1990s. Thank you. We can continue with going further and further. Now with uh, Thomas' question, I will read it for him because he is in a noisy environment. Um, I'm Thomas now. Can you elaborate on cooperation and conflict of interests in the Arctic region, Arctic Silk Road and Arctic energy resources and how it affects Russian, Sino-Russian cooperation or tensions regarding the climate crisis? Mm, that's a good question. I'm not super well equipped for that because it's one area which I have not really paid great attention to. And there, there are other people out there who study Chinese Arctic policy and, and Russian Arctic policy in a much greater detail than I have. Uh, my take, of course, is that yeah, Russia as an Arctic power is a little bit hesitant and not too happy about uh, countries like China laying claim to Arctic or, or trying to conduct activities there. For the Russians, it's a, a perceived sphere of their interest. But the Chinese interest so far has not risen to a level where it has, it, 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 it has triggered, triggered major alarm bells in Moscow. It hasn't happened yet, although this is something that we know the Russians are watching very carefully. And, and it also seems that they are trying to collaborate on some things that are not too controversial on either side uh, in the Arctic. It's, a, it's indeed a very interesting uh, issue, but I will move to uh, Oded, Oded Rabinovich. Um, Thank you, I very much enjoyed the talk, even though I don't really know anything in particular because this is far from my area. But I, I want to go back to the historical core of your, what you were discussing and ask whether a comparison of Chinese relations with India can illuminate things on the Chinese perspective. Because when you compare it with India, you have military flare-ups happening across decades between China and India and Tibet and those regions. You have an initial socialist tendencies, if you look at someone like Nero, but ultimately, India goes towards non-alignment. So the politics are not politics of reproachment with the US, but they go into a different direction. So in terms of trying to figure out what's going on in Beijing, is a comparison between policy towards the USSR and policy towards India could really be helpful in developing what you're trying to do. Mm, mm, mm. That's, uh, uh, thank you. This is a very complex question. Of course, India is uh, a very important participant of the uh, si uh, Sino-Soviet relationship. Really, since the 1950s, um, it was with India that China first tried to develop its so-called um, peaceful uh, principles, five principles of peaceful coexistence. This was... Uh, um, those were, were, were being worked out between John Lai, Prime Minister John Lai, a Nehru, uh, in 19, sort of 1953, 1954. And then that relationship actually developed quite positively in the 1950s. The Indian uh, Nehru saw that China, despite being communist, was also coming to trying to overcome its legacy of being subdued by imperialist powers. Uh, the Indians were also trying to do the same thing. But then the relationship really started to deteriorate in a major way in the late 1950s, partially because of what was happening in Tibet and because of their disputed border, um, which uh, from the Chinese perspective, you know, Nehru was trying to claim too much of the border and the Chinese leadership, Mao Zedong in particular, thought that Nehru was trying to bully him. He kept talking about it, Nehru, he's trying to bully me, what's going on here, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, the 1962 war was an effort by Mao Zedong to teach, quote unquote, teach Nehru a lesson, um, which I guess was quite successful in this regard because it was a major defeat for the Indians. Um, but the Soviets started to... Uh, they were really concerned about this relationship already in the, in the late 50s, when the relationship between China and India started to deteriorate, partially because I think India and China were both you know, great powers. Ultimately, they were also struggling for leadership in the broader kind of global south or the third world, as it was called back then. But the Soviets were really concerned about it, and they were trying to, to 
pressure Mao to be to take a softer line on India uh, because they felt that if Mao just kept being so militant with the Indians, the Indians would turn to the West and this would be a loss for the ostensible project of trying to win India over from its stand of non-alignment towards greater alliance to greater alliance with the socialist camp. And uh, Mao was really frustrated by that. And by the way, this is one of the reasons for the, the deterioration of the Soviet China, uh, Sino-Soviet relationship in 1959, because the Soviets took a neutral position in the Sino-Indian conflict. And they were quite annoyed, you know, the Chinese were quite annoyed by that and thought that this was a betrayal. So this is kind of a historical background to your question, but your question is something else. The, your question is whether the uh, uh, Chinese approach to India in the sense that they see certain disagreements with them, for example, the still unresolved border issue, still, uh, you know, the Chinese still try to maintain a degree of collaboration with the Indians. And indeed, when conflicts do arise, as they have in recent months along the Sino-Indian frontier, they manage to settle them peacefully, by peaceful means. Even though every time that they would have a conflict on the Sino-Indian frontier, lots of people immediately say, oh, watch this, they're going to have a war and maybe there's going to be a nuclear war or something like that. You know, But the Chinese and the Indians still are able to sort out their problems. And I think I think you're quite right in the sense that both sides recognize that there's nobody who would win from a conflict between these two powers, uh, except for third parties that wish both of them ill. So in this sense, the Soviet, uh, the Russian Chinese relationship is also, you know, it's also paralleled, paralleled by the Sino Indian relationship in the, in the sense that they kind of all see themselves uh, they recognize that they have historical grievances and conflicts and problems, but it's in their interest to try to work with one another, try to settle these problems. And in fact, the most interesting, and here's you know historical parallel, I'll highlight one, one interesting historical parallel. In 1989, of course, we know that there was a Tiananmen crackdown and the Chinese a government unleashed forces on the student protesters, brutally suppressing, you know, drowning Tiananmen Square in blood, basically. Um, after that, China's relationship with the West worsened dramatically. For a number of years, there were sanctions imposed by European countries, also by the American Congress, on the account of the Tiananmen crackdown. Gorbachev, despite being the prophet of democratization and, you know, uh, uh, freedom, et cetera, et cetera, actually tried to use this opportunity to build a triangular relationship with China and India. His relationship with uh, Rajiv Gandhi was already very good at that point. He had a very good relationship, you know, personally, and Soviet relation with India was also quite good. Soviet relations with China had also been normalized. The only missing link there was a proper Sino-Indian normalization. And Gorbachev in his meetings with Rajiv Gandhi said, you know, Try to break the logjam. See if you can repair the relationship, and then we can speak about a triangle, Sino-Soviet-Indian triangle, which would be geopolitically, I won't say in opposition, but yeah, in some kind of a juxtaposition to the West. So there's more to Gorbachev than what people usually assume. In fact, in some ways, Gorbachev was the prophet of what later developed as BRICS, you know, in some ways, you know, the whole like, kind of great grand alliance of this countries, uh, Russia, China, you know, India, Brazil, et cetera. So that's a, that's a long winded answer, but I, I, I think I, I touched on what you were trying to say there. Yeah, I think, I, think I, I understand this parallel. Fascinating. I'll, I'll end with a very quick question. As a, as a moderator, and it's uh, you were talking about uh, personal relations versus or not versus uh, ideology in the 1950s. I wonder if when you look at uh, the relationship between uh, Xi Jinping and Putin today and uh, China Russia today, uh, do you see this kind of personal touch to it that uh, perhaps trumps, pun intended? the um, other more ideological or geostrategic issues? Well, it's, it's both, uh, and, and, and that's the key. Uh, Xi Jinping and Putin have a very good personal relationship. They clearly appeal to one another. They're, they're strong men. They're quite brutal in many ways and anti-democratic, and maybe they also see this kind of ideological glue bringing them together. But I would argue that the, there's a broader 
um, there's a, there's a broader kind of connection between the uh, Russian elites and the Chinese elites in the sense that they both recognize the importance of engagement with one another. So it's not just Putin, Xi Jinping. In fact, before that, it was Yeltsin. It was a very different character and had very good relations with Jiang Zemin, for example. Putin maybe did not have such a good close personal relation with Hu Jintao, but still the relationship between the two countries improved and prospered, despite, by the way, the ups and downs in Russian Chinese rela uh, Russian Western relations and Chinese Western relations. So that the uh, Russian Chinese relationship has been on almost a constant kind of uh, in, in, uh, trajectory of improvement, no matter who the leaders are, and no matter what their respective countries relationship with the West is, I think the reason for that is because there's a broader understanding that goes way beyond Putin and Xi Jinping about the importance of a close align alignment, not alliance, but alignment, trying to work, in, you know, work out their, their relationship. Partly again, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, a consequence of the historical legacy of the bitterness that the two sides have seen. Thank you so much, Professor Adchenko. It was a pleasure. It was fascinating. Thank you for coming to talk to us. Thank you. I'm very, very pleased. And uh, yeah, hope uh, we'll maintain contact. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, perhaps one of these days we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a personal conversation somewhere. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh,